Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, March 20th. We are picking up in Bearer's Sheet, Genesis chapter 36, approximately verse 9. But as we came into this chapter, we saw that Esau were getting his uh, progeny. We're getting details about the line of the Edomites. Esau became known as Edom also, the name being synonymous. So when we talk about the Edomites, they are the ones who come from Esau. We saw in the early verses in chapter 36 that uh, there's a time when Yaakov, Jacob, his brother, the brother of Esau, and he, they're, they're, they both were so blessed that there was too much in the way of flocks and, and people and herds and all that they needed to move further apart from each other so that there would be enough pasturage, enough space etc etc looks to be a very amicable separation it may have happened at the time of Yitzhak's passing home well he didn't go home to glory like we do he went into Sha'ol into the paradise side it may have happened then it may have happened a little after we're not really sure but uh, Yaakov has been back in the land at a minimum of 10 years he's probably is between 11 and 15 years because he spent time in Shechem before he came down to Beersheba and we saw all of that in the last chapter. So we saw that uh, um, Esau moved his family, his flocks and all into the area called Mount Seir. It's in Edom on the maps of ancient Israel. It's an area that we see Jordan as the name today. We know Petra is in Edom. Petra was the capital at the time. Early capital, maybe I should say. I don't know if I can say it was at the time of Esau, but an early capital of this area was Petra. It's the mountainous region southeast of the Dead Sea. And uh, we saw that even as fulfillment of the scriptures that Esau would break the yoke that his brother had on him. That yoke was his brother being the one chosen by God to be the first uh, born, have the birthright of the family, even though he was born holding on to Esau's heel. But God put him into that position and uh, Esau never accepted liking it and he, the, the prophecy was that he would break the yoke so by moving a distance he wasn't under Yaakov. He's taking care of himself and has his own freedom. By the time we get down here going on from verse 9 on, we've got the Edomites, we've got the Esau's line is a race of people, not just a family. So we read a lot of that, but I think just for the sake of uh, continuity, we'll pick up with verse 9. Let me say clearly again to the Arabs that we call people Arabs today were the descendants of Ishmael. Abraham and Hagar had Ishmael, and their line is what we call the Arab people. Esau's descendants, Esau is the twin brother of Jacob, the son of Yitzhak, Isaac, and Rebekah, Rivka. His descendants are the Edomites or the Edomians. We lose sight of them about 70 AD in history, but we know that there are prophecies about their land, prophecies about Edom and Moab. Moab is directly above or north, below. When's Edom and when's Moab? Um, on the map. It's got to be below. Eden's got to be below because of Jordan. Anyway, you'll find them both side by side. Uh, you know, I, but I shouldn't say side by side. They're not east-west, they're north-south, and they're on the um, eastern side of the Jordan River in the area called Jordan today, as I've already said. Sorry, I made a mess out of that, but I think you you follow me anyway. We have Moshe, Moshe who is the author, Moses. He's the author writing the, these books for us. He gets credit for the first five books, but we know that he used tablets that um, each family member had been passing down that had been given, I'll say the assignment from God, like Abraham kept the records, then Yitzhak kept records, now we've been reading Yaakov's records and it'll go on down the line because obviously Moshe was not living at the time of Abraham. Now we know God gives all the intel to the writers that if it isn't that they had to have something given to them, but we know that God also used what was written down and given. So his editorial note came in here in verse nine when it says that the records of the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites, 
They're not called Edomites yet right now with Esau, but by the time Moshe is writing it, they are. So he's just making it clear. He had more knowledge of the area and how things developed, and he's making sure that everybody understands. So that's why we see written a little ahead, but of the fact of when they were called, we know that they will be called. The Edomites that they lived in the hill country of Seir, as I've already said, verse 10. The names of Esau's sons. This is a repeat of verse 4, but since that was last week, we'll read through it again. And if I slaughter the names, forgive me. I'm not telling you I know how to pronounce all of these names. I don't, but we'll call them Eliphaz, the son of Esau's wife, Adah. Ruel, the son of Esau's wife, Basimoth, or you can have Bashamoth in, in your translation. Verse 11 says that the sons of Eliphaz, so now the grandsons of Esau, were Teman, Omar, Zepho, Kotom, and Kenaz. Okay, five grandsons from one son, from Eliphaz. He had five boys, and Eliphaz's wife was Adah. Okay, now verse 12. Timna was a concubine of Esau's son, Eliphaz. So Eliphaz had wife Adah, but he also had a concubine called Timna. Concubine is like a wife without the privileges of a wife. We also see like Bilhah and Zilpha were called handmaids of Rachel and of Leah, but they um, had sons by Yaakov the father we you know so it's the same sort of setup so by Timna we see that Eliphaz has one more grandchild okay the concubine of Esau's son Eliphaz and she bore Amalek to Eliphaz probably why she got named because usually the women aren't named but it was um, strategic that that we know where Amalek came from that he came from this line from Esau's sons, um, grandsons, whatever, concubine, <laughs> anyway. Um, I can get real tongue twisted in these relations. If I say it wrong, read it in the scripture, you'll get it right. But we talked last week about the spirit that comes out of Amalek, that uh, they always caused trouble for Israel. They were the first uh, enemy of Israel when the Israel came out of Egypt before they came into the promised land. We saw that God said his judgment would be against them, but he also said that um, every generation that God would be dealing against the Amalekites. We see it true through down to Haman, Haman, the book of Esther, that will uh, celebrate the victory over Haman uh, um, this, this Saturday in Shabbat, so join us if you're around. But it was a time when they wanted to wipe, Haman wanted to wipe the Jews off the face of the map, that's the spirit of Amalek, not just a, a warring for a piece of, of land, but a, a direct hatred of the Jewish race that wants to annihilate them for no other reason. We see that all the way through Israel's history as God had prophesied that the, the, from generation to generation, this is what they would be dealing with, but the Lord would be the one that would do the battle. We see a Hitler, we see an end of the Holocaust and a Jewish nation reborn in a day. Right now we see the battle of Hamas, whose intent is nothing but the same. Wipe Israel off the face of the map. They don't want the land, and that's why they're fighting so that if you gave them land as in a two-state solution, that then there would be peace. No, they want the peace called Israel because they want to annihilate the Jewish people. It's in their creed. You will hear it. You'll hear it in their chants, and their mantras. You will hear it in what they are expounding to their young people, inciting them for war against Israelis, that uh, the only good Jew is a dead Jew, and they will go after them apart from the land of Israel once they have conquered the land of Israel. Thank God they never will, because God will not allow it to happen. But it's that same spirit, and it's an evil spirit. It is really the spirit of Satan, whose intent has been from the beginning to wipe out the race that was going to bring the Messiah. And then when he was not able to stop, he tried to, to bring the death of Messiah in human form as a baby. That didn't work. He thought he was finally getting his victory at crucifixion, but it was the crushing of the heel foretold in, in Bereshit in Genesis 3.15. But we know that the victory was that that heel that he thought he's crushing would crush his 
head. And there will be that day when Satan will go down in flames into the eternal flame called hell forever and ever. Never to torment, never to, to uh, deceive, never to touch those alive ever again. And the greatest hallelujah will go up from the whole earth and all around the earth, the heavens and everything will declare hallelujah when that finally comes. But that will not come until after the second coming of Yeshua, millennial kingdom, and um, a time shortly after that. So we see the spirit, we see it's by Satan, we know the next time, I believe, because I think we're that close, the next time we'll, we'll, we will see it not just by Hamas, but we'll see it by the one called Antichrist, who is against Christ, and he will go after the Jewish people to wipe them off the face of the earth during the tribulation time. He will also go after the believers at that time too. Revelation 12, 5 makes it clear who he's going after. And we also read in Daniel and other places that he is being, um, he, that Satan's spirit literally enters into the Antichrist and that's who is behind and trying to bring it out. That God will have the final say, hallelujah. And there will finally be a day when there will be war no more. We'll get a thousand years of peace in the millennium, but then there'll be an eternity after we see Satan and all that are like-minded in the pit of hell forever. Hallelujah. So, we'll go on with the, the line though, the sons of Esau. Uh, we've done, we were in verse 12, that the concubine had um, Amalek. And then it says, these are the sons of Esau's wife, Adah. Then verse 13, we get, um, and actually those are sons and grandsons. The Hebrew will use the word interchangeably. In verse 13, we have the sons of Ruel, Nahath, Zara, Shema, and Mizah. Again, I don't know if I'm saying it right, but those are four grandsons of Esau's. His son, Raul, married, um, well, the, yeah, the wife, Bashemoth, we read about. Bashemoth had Raul. Raul had these four grandsons then of Esau, the four sons here. Verse 14, and these were the sons of Esau's wife, Ahalabama. Remember, he had three wives. He had two when Jacob went to Padan Arm to get his wife. He had two heathen wives that did not please Yitzhak and Rivka. Third wife now is Ahalabama. And in verse 14, we have the same sons recorded that we saw in verse 5. And that is, um, and she's the daughter of Anad. We'll talk about that in a bit. The granddaughter of Zibion. She bore to Esau, Ye Yehush, Yalam, and Korah. Okay, so same sons as verse 14. We're just getting the line as it develops because notice a key change in words in verse 15. We have these are the chiefs of the sons of of Esau. So as the line has developed, as they've put down their roots and, and taken, um, um, they're, they're doing their, living their lives in the area of Mount Seir and they're coming up in predominance, we're going to see they're now being called chiefs. You may have sheiks or rulers in your version. All of that is correct. Chiefs, dukes, uh, it just depends on what translation you're using. If you see duke, that meant a rock dweller. Sheik meant a governor or a ruler, and uh, rock dweller, I can only imagine that, that the area they lived in was more rocky, and that's why they were being called that. But verse 15 and 16, we're going to see the same grandsons that were mentioned in verse 11, and we're going to see that by the time we're done with these three wives of Esau, we've got 14 dukes or chiefs or sheiks, whatever your version is calling it, named. So verses 15 and 16 say these are the chiefs of the sons of Esau, the sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn of Esau, are chief Taman, chief Omar, chief Zepho, chief Kanaz, verse 16, chief Korah, chief Gatam, and chief Amalek. These are the chiefs descended from Eliphaz in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Adah. Okay, we're just getting the line, the genealogical line. That's why the women aren't mentioned, because the men carried the line and the names down. Verse 17, we're going to his other son now, Raul, the sons of Raul, Esau's son, so Esau's grandsons, Chief Nahath, Chief Zerah, Chief Shema, and Chief Mizah. These are the chiefs descended from Raul in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Esau's wife, Basmoth, or Bashamoth, depending on which translation you have going. So 
Again, now we've got the grandsons named again. Same ones as in verse 13. In verse 18, it'll be the same ones named in verse 14. But now it's being brought down that here in earlier it was here sons. Now it's here's grandsons. It's also showing that now they've gone from just being named to now they're chiefs and, and rulers and, and leaders and so forth. So verse, where did I leave off? 18? Yes. These are the sons of Esau's wife, Ahalabama, Chief Yoish, Chief Yalam, and Chief Korah. These are the chiefs descended from Esau's wife, Ahalabama, the daughter of Anak. Again, just spelling out what we've had before. So we don't have any grandsons mentioned for um, or from Ahalabama, just three sons. So probably they didn't go on and have any little little cheeks, <laughs> grandsons, okay? Verse 19, these are the sons of Esau, that is Edom. See how the names become synonymous by this point now? And these are their chiefs, okay? 14 chiefs mentioned their name from Esau's three wives. That behind us, we'll look at verse 20, and we have the sons of Seir, the Horite, the inhabitants of the land. Remember, it was called Mount Seir, and the people that were in that land when Esau moved his family over there were the ones known as Horites and sometimes known as Hittites. So we're seeing that the, this line is given probably because Edom or Esau intermarried with this line. We'll see that in verse 22, I think it is, in verse 25. So Seir, the Horite, the inhabitants of the land of Edom, when Esau came to Mount Seir. And uh, we know from archaeology that the, the, they were a people. The Horites were thought to be a um, smaller group inside the Hittites. I think I said it right way. I always have trouble. I want to mix those two up. But anyway, the two are very closely related. The Hittites weren't known until, apart from the Bible, until about the 20th century. So people would argue and say, see if this was fact, there'd be proof of it. Well, guess what? You give archaeology long enough, you turn a spade, you'll turn a Bible page. And archaeology and expeditions have revealed that east of Ankara, Turkey, which is Asia Minor, which would be north of Edom and Moab, that that was the capital of the Hittite Empire. And they found out that there was preeminence of the Hittite Empire from 2000 to 1800 BC. Hmm, 2000 to 1800. That just happens to be during the time of Avraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, and Esau. So does that prove what the Bible says here? Absolutely. And the other time when they were known to be predominant is from 1400 to 1200 BC. Happens to be in the days of David, David and his son Shlomo, Solomon. And you'll hear about them when you study those Bible uh, characters, as we call them. So, just very interesting. Um, in verse 20 here, with it being listed, apart from, from this, the Hittites have been completely forgotten for thousands of years. But now they've been discovered to be a large people. They settled north Mesopotamia in Syria and in Israel before 2000 BC. And then here as God has given it to us during Esau's time. But they have found thousands of tablets. And uh, those contain their business documents. It contains other records that, that show they, how they were living life. Those are the excavations that have been found. But here again, probably God brought it into the biblical records because of their intermarriage into Esau's line. So we read a little bit about the Hittite um, progeny here also. By the way, let me say that Seir, the name that the man that the country area was probably named after, he's a little older than Esau. He would have been contemporary with Esau's father, Isaac. He would have been the generation just before. Um, and probably, like I say, probably settled the region, the pioneer of the region, I'll put it that way. So uh, why it became called Seir. So in their line, we have verse, I guess, did I read verse 20? The sons of Seir, the Horite, the inhabitants of the land. No, I stopped right there. Here they are. Lotan, Shobal, Zibion, and Anna. Okay. Lotan, Shobal, and Zibion were the three brothers. Anna 
with Zibian's son. We saw we see that down in verse 24. The sons of Zibian, Allah, and Anah. Okay? So even though Anah gets put up there, Anah is Zibian's son. Zibian. Here's where I have to hold on to my head. Okay, up in verse 2. Go back up to verse 2 because that was last week. We have Esau took his wives from the daughters of Canaan, Adah, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. We're talking about the Hittites. Ahalabama, daughter of Anah, and the granddaughter of Zibion the Hivite. So Anah is Zibion's son, Seir's grandson, Esau's wife's grandfather, and Anah, Esau's wife's father, that we all see all that in verse 2, they're the ones that intermarrying now in verse 25. So if I lost you, I totally understand. If you're really good at these kind of um, genealogical trees, you followed me, if you care about it enough, map it out, draw your own tree, and you can put the names out and see it. But I think we've said enough just to point out Seir and Yitzhak were alive at the same time. Now we've got Esau and we've got the sons and the grandsons, Zibion and all that come from Edom's, come mix into Edom's line or into mixing into Esau's line. That's why they're being named. So as we go on in verses 20 to 22, we're going to see that Seir had five sons. He had 12 grandchildren. He had one granddaughter, okay? Five sons, 12 grandsons, one great-grandson, four great-great-grandchildren. That's all going to be named here in verses 20 to 22. Just hold on to your hat, <laughs> okay? Um, so we've got, okay, I've read 20, 21, Dishon, Ezer, and Dishon. Notice how Dishon and Dishon, they have to go give names so close it's going to confuse you also. <laughs> Okay, just adding to the, the confusion. These are the chiefs. These would be the rulers. These would be the leaders of the descendant from the Horites. They're the sons of Seir in the land of Edom. Okay, remember the Horite. Zibion was the first one mentioned as a Hivite in the Horites. Yeah, the Hivites were the small group. The Horites were the bigger group. So they're all, you know, they probably were like half-brothers and so forth, you know, all mixed up in there. I did not feel like we needed to get bogged down in that anymore. I think we're getting enough to just understand. Um, if you want better, go to genealogist. <laughs> okay. Seer will have seven sons. Those sons are called chiefs. They're called rulers, leaders, maybe like a mayor or maybe even a little better. They're named here in verses 20 and 21. Again, Lotan, Shobal, Zibion, Anna, Dishon, Ezer, and Dishon. Dishon and Dishon, I'll put it that way. Okay, verse 21. Um, Dishon, the one that's spelled O-N, he's Ohalabama's uh, brother, and that makes him Esau's brother-in-law. See verse 25? These are the children of Anah, Dishon and Ohalabama, the daughter of Anah. So they're brother and brother-in-law now um, to Esau. Verse 22, I'm trying not to totally confuse you. It's just hard, <clears throat> verbally especially. They're just all family. They're all family, absolutely, absolutely. And because of their marriage, we get their line. Verse 22, the sons of Lotan were Hori and Himam. And Lotan's sister was Timna. So Timna's a Horite. She's a sister of Lotan. And therefore, it makes her a sister of Zibion, because we saw that in verse 20, that Lotan and Zibion were related. Or she might be just a half-sister, because again, we don't know where the line's mixing. I'm not going to argue about it. But since she's mentioned as Lotan's sister, that's the only way that she's mentioned, it could have been a polygamous, polygamous marriage, it could have been a concubine, you know, where we're not exactly sure how. But Zibion was the grandfather of one of Esau's wives. We saw that in verse 2. So he could have been, hold on, the half-brother of the concubine of Esau's son, Eliphaz. That was one of, another one of Esau's wives. Maybe one of the family of Timnah mentioned in verse 12, 
but if the age span is too much if this tim knows up here rather than down here two generations later then this would have been someone who they picked up the name like we name people after relatives that lived before and she could have been a half sister of esau's wife's grandfather that she this one was named after or i think it has to be that way i think this one would have been too old to marry and have children at this point unless she is named after that one okay just point in bringing it out is those who are good with it can show you there's nothing wrong with what the scripture is saying someone will grab that and say oh then you've got you know a, a real old lady married to somebody young having babies no not necessarily it could be the half sister the concubine it could be <clears throat> named after in my own family i've got uh, <clears throat> the one level and the children under that weren't juniors but were given the same name first name okay so what's important is coming up in verse 24 or is of interest i think and these are the sons of zibian allah ayah that's ayah sorry yeah that's an ayah not an l excuse me ayah and anah now he is the anah who found the hot springs in the wilderness you well, might have wrong, I, I am on verse 24 and you may have instead of hot springs you may have the meals m-u-l-e-s yes. okay we go on here with that translation as meals the hebrew is telling us it was called hot springs the only way i can understand it is a meal would bring would carry and hot springs carried the the hot waters and all that came with it i don't know if that's how it got the name mule but what we have is that this one anah found these hot springs in the wilderness found means he discovered them the wilderness is the desert hebrew uses that word interchangeably we have you know that they were the children of israel were in the desert for 40 years wandering okay so he found these hot springs when he was pasturing the donkeys and that shows you if they're they're feeding them it couldn't have been total desert it had to have been wilderness you know it had to have been um there had to have been something to feed on so he was tending um the donkeys of his father zibian when he discovered these hot springs you can understand it you've seen how the, right here in our own area we have the hot springs up in in arrowhead that are just north of san bernardino someone discovered those one day just went into the area and found them that's what's being said but remember when you talk about the wells and the water associated with them that the hebrew word is beer b-e-e-r beer sheva remember was the seven wells that could be why this one who here is named which name was it who who discovered him um anat is the one who discovered him it could be why he's named beery b-e-e-r-i the man of the wells who is the father of judith judith in verse 34 when we get down there that's another name for ahal obama so we see the connection we can put it all together but the the, the ones that want to argue will say well how can it be a knot and how can it be beery well a found the waters it easily could see how he got nicknamed for that so he got credit for it. he became known as the man of the water so he became known as the man of the wells the man of the springs he became known as beery in the hebrew so it's easy to see how a knock could get that name we often will nickname someone according to something that does relate to them even as simple as color my dad had carrot top hair when he was young and his nickname was red <laughs> he was red because oh he had carrot top hair a couple of his close friends and growing up years called him red <laughs> yeah. so we do that he easily could have been named that there's no problem and no controversy here if they're looking for trouble they'll find trouble whether it's accurate or not and in this case i believe it's not so verse 25 these are the children of anah dishon and halabama the daughter of anah okay anah esau's father-in-law dishon esau's brother-in-law aholabama esau's wife same thing that they were saying earlier um, I think I brought out to you that Zibian was from Seir. He was from the Horites. We saw that in verse 20. 
and the Horites are part of the Hivites in verse 2. Again, the Hivites being a smaller, it's like the Horite was the big clan, and one part of the family got known as the Hivites, but they were part of the Horites. Uh, again, relations, we do that with our last names. Those that marry, especially the female who marries, her family name sometimes gets swallowed up by the name of who she married, but those that were part of her family before her marriage or her siblings and all would still be known by that family name. That's all we're seeing. No contradictions. That's all we're seeing. So, verse 26. And these are the sons of Dishon, Hemden, Ashban, Ithran, and Haran. Okay, that would have been Esau's brother-in-law's children. That makes them his nephews. Okay, verses 27 and 28. These are the sons of Ezer, Bilhan, Zaavan, and Akan. I don't think I need to say anything about them. The sons of Deshaun are Uz, whoops, and Aaron. I just closed my Bible. <laughs> okay, Aran. Okay, now Uz that we get mentioned here in verse 28. Um, let me tell you first. Ezer and Deshaun uh, were mentioned in verse 21. And again, they were either brothers-in-law of Esau's or the brother of Anah. We don't know, but, you know, just relations. Uz is interesting, or Uz, depending on how you pronounce it, verse 28, because that's the same place that we hear that Eov, Job, came from. When you look at the book of Job, chapter 1 and verse 1, it tells us that he lived in the land of Uz, or the land of Uz. But Eov himself, Job, would have been prior to this time. He lived probably contemporary or just slightly before Avraham. So we're all the way down to Avraham's grandchildren. It's not the same. Um, Job wouldn't have been alive down here, but it, it probably was the same area, and it probably was named after the O's or O's, however I should say it, that came from Shem when we read all the way back the genealogy of Noah's three sons and we read about that in chapter 10 and verse 23. So when you read Oz, Oz, Az, whatever, in Genesis 10 in Shem's line, it's the, probably the same place here that's being referred to in this line. We're working in that same area and the whole area of Oz would have been Northern Arabia area known today as. So, Verse 29. Yeah, that's what I was trying to figure out. Uh, so these dukes, they're like mayor, they're like... Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, you were out of the room when I said that. Chiefs, rulers, it just shows that they're not just... Um, that, that they're growing now. They've got more than just a single family here. They've got families. They've got rulers over the families. Mm -hmm. The heads now are being called chiefs or, or rulers or dukes. Mayor is a good word for us. Yes, that idea. Verse 29, did I do that one? The sons, these are the chiefs uh, descended from the Horites. Chief Loton, Chief Shabal, Chief Zibion, Chief Anak. Same names that we've been hearing now. They're, you know, moving up the, the ladder, okay? And verse 30, Chief Deshaun, Chief Azar, Chief Deshaun. These are the chiefs defend, descended from the Horites according to their various chiefs in the land of Seir. So now we've got the chiefs, the heads, the leaders, of the Seir family that intermarried with Esau's family, okay? And that's all the point that it is there. As we move into verses 31 to 39, we're introduced to a new word, just to add to our confusion. <laughs> They're going to be called kings. And that's again when those against the word of God have popped up and said, there weren't such things as kings then, they couldn't be kings, well, remember, Moshe is writing a little later, and we have the prophecies of kings that are coming. Avraham, we, we hear that, that um, Ishmael, when he was concerned about Ishmael, that out of Ishmael's um, progeny would come kings. We know that was promised in Yaakov's line also. So it, it's just king probably is replacing the name chief because they're, they're getting larger and higher, and it's another level down that's in the picture now. So, you know, they've got the greats and the greats and the grandsons, and they have leaders that are chiefs and rulers, and now they have great chiefs and great rulers, and they're calling them kings. So um, often 
it seems in our history, in our um, non-biblical history, what do I call that, secular history, it seems often that the name king started happening when there were more cities rather than tribes. Okay, so it's becoming more of a city, more of a community, and they're calling them kings there. But it, it's no, um, no contradiction. If you want to know where to Abraham and Sarah was promised kings would come from their son, that's Genesis 17, verses 6 and 16. And then for Yaakov, Jacob, it was promised in chapter 35 and verse 11. That one's not so far back, but by the time you get through all these names, I don't expect you to remember it all. But again, just prophetic instructions regarding future kings. So no contradiction, no problem. It's just showing the names that, that were coming in, that they were growing greater in their role, and they were becoming more of a people. Now they're cities. They're not just a family, not just a tribe. Okay, verse 30... I think 31. I, 31, I'll read it, but I don't think I have comments for it. I've told you now these are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the sons of Israel. We know that, excuse me, we don't have kings named for Israel till we get to King Saul. He's the first one. So we know, yes, these people were being called kings before that. Fine, not a problem. That's it, even... It's true of scripture because that's why Israel ended up with an earthly king is they wanted to be like the other nations. We want a king. We want a king. We want a king. You know, God said, I'm your king. We want an earthly king. We want an earthly king. That was a big mistake. But anyway, commentary back on track. Verse 32, Bela the son of Baor reigned in Edom in the name of his city. So now you know they're establishing cities was Din Haba. Okay, don't know anything about Din Habad, don't need to. Then Bella died, and Job, jo, okay, in my Hebrew, Yobab, but Jobab, Jobab, however, the son of Zerah of Bozrah became king in his place. Okay, I'm uh, just making sure I'm giving you all my notes. Okay, this, this fact here that it's mentioned, I've got to reread it myself, um, became. I'm looking for the word became. It should be in verse 33. Bella died and Joab, yeah, there we go, became king. Okay, you may have reigned king. Either way, um, what we're noting is this was not Bella's son. It seems like successors now are being elected or they conquer the kingdom rather than it being handed down in heritage. You know, up until this point, if the father was the ruler, the chief, the one who was becoming called a king finally, then usually the oldest son would be the next one and so forth. Now there's a break. Bella was not the, uh, or I mean, um, who was named in 33? Um, Job, Jobab, Job, that name I struggle with. He was not Bella's son. Okay, then verse 33, um, I'm sorry, verse 34, then Jobab, the one who became that king, that leader, he died. And Husham, see again, not his son, but Husham of the land of the Timnites became king in his place. So again, we're just seeing that now it, it seems to be either by election or by uh, ability to rule over. We've got different name changes coming into place. So verse 35, Husham died. And Hadad, the son of Hadad, who defeated Midian in the field of Moab, becomes king in his place. I emphasize defeated because this is the only time it sounds like a military battle and that uh, the military exploit detected who, de what's the word I want? Dictated <laughs> who became king. So the Edomite kings are now is coming out of military, now coming out of might, okay? Just as the, the history begins to evolve more and more. Um, okay, so he defeated, uh, again, I've lost my place. I need to keep my finger there. There we go. He defeated Midian in the field of Moab. Remember, Moab is right next to um, Edom. He became king in his, place, in his place, and the name of his city was Avit, or Avith, however you pronounce it, okay? Again, we don't see a permanent capital of the area of Edom. We don't see a dynasty. We don't see rulers uh, in the families. We see the cities change and the rulers change, okay? 
just keep that in, in your mind. Then um, Hadad died, and Samia of Masraka became king in his place, and Samia died, and Shaul, Shaul of Rehoboth on the Euphrates River became king in his place. So you see how it's telling us now the, the king is ruling from the, the palace or the place on the Euphrates River. Okay, that's Persian area maybe. Anyway, then Shaul died, and Baal Hanan, the son of Achbor, became king in his place. Now we're down to verse 39. Then Baal, Baal Hanan, the son of Achbor, died, and Hadar became king in his place, and the name of his city was Pao, and his wife's name was Ahadabel, the daughter of Mitrad, daughter of Mezahabah. Okay, his, that one's daughter. Now, Hadar and Hadad, we see similar in Scripture, and it could be the same name. In 1 Chronicles 1 and verse 51, we see that name there. Let me take you there real quick. There is a reason for this. So go with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 1 and verse 51. 1 Chronicles, which is also giving us um, chapter 1. It's also giving us genealogical lines and so forth. First Chronicles 1 verse 51, we read here, When Baal Hanan died, Hadad became king in his place, and the name of the city was Pa'o, or Pa'i, and his wife's name was Mahadabal, the daughter of Matrad, the daughter of Mesahab. Okay, same line, same people. You can tell the names are the same. It's just like even now. When we try to spell a name from Hebrew into English, we can do little variations, but we're talking about the same name. I could spell Bereshit three different ways and have Jewish people agree each one is Genesis. Okay, it's just trying to go from one language into another. But the point in bringing this out is it doesn't say that Hadad died. He may have still been alive and reigning when Moshe did the records and put the books together. Because back here in Genesis 36, we have Hadad introduced, and he's different from the Hadad earlier in verse 36, because we follow that line that you just read in Genesis 36 and 1 Chronicles 1. But what's interesting is stay in 1 Chronicles 1 for a moment with me, and look down at verse 43. And you have, now these are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom, so we're talking the same language as our Genesis, before any of the kings of the sons of Israel reigned. Bela was the son of Baor, and the name of his city was Dehaba, and I read the wrong verse. I wanted to go to 51. Why I read 43 to you, I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> no, I did. My note said to read 43. What I'm trying to get to is there's a place in here, and I've got the wrong reference down, apparently, even though I've done this several times. Uh, over and over in my mind, you've got that Hadad died. There he is, verse 51. So 43 tells us we're in the same line. Verse 51 says, then Hadad died. So Hadad's alive in Bereshit in Genesis chapter 36, where we're reading when Moshe recorded it. By the time we get to 1 Chronicles chapter 1, we have Hadad died, and we go on down from there. So what we see is that how correct scripture is. Moshe didn't tell us he was dead because he wasn't. In First Chronicles, a thousand years later, of course he's dead. <laughs> a thousand years, yeah, but, I'm but, so. yeah, exactly. But it just shows you how right on target they were. Moshe wrote as it was. He gave the you know when he put in any of his editorial notes, they were accurate notes. Okay. Now, with all that in mind, go back. We're almost to the end of the genealogies. If you don't like them, hang in there. Some people love them. Some people hate them. <laughs> okay. I think we are ready for, yes, we're ready for verse 40. Now, these are the names of the chiefs descended from Esau, Esau, according to their families and their localities by their names. Chief Timna, Chief Ala, Chief Yat Yatoth, however you say it, okay? <laughs> Again, they're, they're clan leaders, they're sheiks, they ruled their own people, and it's all in the realm of the Edomite kings. When it says they descended from, you might have they came out of. It means the same thing. They're their descendants. They're their, their genealogical family. They have the same DNA according to their families. That's who indicated the sheiks, not the kings. By the time you get to kings, remember, it's not necessarily by father to son to son. And their localities or their places, 
the, probably were named for their leaders. Like Seir, the area became known as Mount Seir, you know, often like that. So that's all this is telling us, is giving us the accuracy of the Edomite area that, that we're studying here. Um, where did I leave off? I can read the rest of these names. Chief Ahalabama, Chief Allah, Chief Penan, Chief Kanaz, Chief Taman, Chief Midzbar, Midzar. <laughs> <laughs> Verse <You're> 43. <laughs> Tom, Tom, Dick, and Harry, okay. They're not Chief, in the book of heaven, so it's not Yeah, Chief Madiel, you're right, and Chief Aram. These are the chiefs of Edom. Now note the note. That is Esau, the father of the Edomites. So you just got Edomite history because it's related to Esau, who is the brother of Yaakov. So they're going to be, their kids are going to be cousins. And that's the whole point out of all of this, okay? But this is where Esau's genealogy in Scripture ends. Um, it, we see a little bit more of what came out of some of those chiefs in First Chronicles 1. Well, I told you the difference in Hadad that he had died, but that's it. Esau's line, the Edomites, probably were incorporated because their descendants have so much to do with that land called Edom. And because we know that the land called Edom still has prophecy yet to be fulfilled. It has some that has been fulfilled, but there's a greater fulfillment coming. It will have much to do with the nation of Israel in the final battle. We have the battle, we have the Lord coming from Bozrah. He comes from Edom in blood because he's, he's annihilating the enemies of, of Israel at the end of the battle of Armageddon. So it's probably why it's given to us in the detail, but notice it goes silent. And as I said, even in secular history, we lose the line of the Edomites because that's not critical. The line that goes down to Messiah is the line that we're going to continue. With that in mind, turn with me to chapter 37, sure to be a bit more of a blessing, I believe, to you because of the pictures we're going to see in chapter 37. This gets to be really rich. I love this. We're going to see four patriarchs named here, Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and we're going to add in the fourth one, Yosef, Joseph, okay? In the, those four names, we have a type of our redemption. Abraham, Abraham, was a type of the doctrine of election, okay? He was elected by God. We know God's the one that called him out. Read with me in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. Come on. Okay, there we go. My tablet is persnickety and it wants me to hit exactly where I should hit. 1 Peter 1, 1 Kepha chapter 1 verse 2. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, he foreknew, he knows the end from the beginning. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Yeshua, Messiah, Jesus Christ, and be sprinkled with his blood. Okay, so keep his writing to those who, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, were chosen, the sanctifying work of the Spirit is what saved them, they came into salvation through obedience to Yeshua, Jesus, and his blood that was, it says, sprinkled here, but poured out for our salvation. So Abraham came into that. God elected. God chose him. But uh, again, by his foreknowledge and by the work of the Ruch HaKodesh through the shed blood of Yeshua, Jesus. Now Yitzhak is a picture of the divine sonship, S-O-N, sonship. He was chosen. We read that in Ephesians 1, 4, and 5. So we've got divine election, now we've got chosen. We'll look at Ephesians 1, verses 4 and 5. And Ephesians 37, right? Yes, we're, we're right there in the very beginning of 37. Ephesians 1, 4, just as he chose us in him when? Before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Yeshua Messiah, Jesus Christ, to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. God willed it. He chose us before the foundation of the world. That means before he created this world as we know it, he knew that there would be, and you can put your name right in there, and he chose for salvation to come to you, not in a way that 
that only the ones he chose could hear, but he knew who would receive. You became a son of the God because God chose you. Okay, God starts it, God initiates it. If he didn't, you wouldn't be here. <laughs> you wouldn't be saved, okay? Now, when we go down to Jacob, we've got Abraham, the, we see the election. We've got Isaac, we see chosen sonship. Now with Jacob, we're going to see the conflict between the two natures. We're going to see either you're governed by your flesh or you're governed by the Spirit of God. And we read of that in Romans 7. In other words, you don't get saved and then you're perfect and you live a perfect life from there on out. You've got a struggle going on in you. <coughs> Chapter 7, verse 25 of Romans um, says, and this is Shaul Paul writing, Thanks be to God through Yeshua Messiah, Jesus Christ, our Adonai, our Lord. So that on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. He's saying, I belong to the Lord, but if I can either be obedient to the law of God and acting like a child of God, or my flesh gets in the way and I act like I'm under the law of sin. I'm still doing sin. And we know Paul many times talked about that struggle back and forth. Which one wins out? The one you feed the most. <laughs> if you feed the flesh, your flesh is going to win out. If you feed your spirit spiritually, then you're going to have what you need to, to win the battle. But boy, do we see that in Yaakov's life. Every intention of his, he wanted to be obedient to God. He wanted to please God. He, he wrestles with God, and then he grabs hold of him, and you don't, I won't let go until you bless me. And he gets called Israel, a new name showing a new character, a ruler with God. He comes into that fellowship with God in that new way, and yet we don't see him live a perfect life yet. You know, he wanted to, but we'll see him referred to as Jacob when he's living his fleshly life, and Israel when he's reflecting his spiritual life. So we see that struggle. We're elected by God, we're chosen, we've become sons, but we are living right now here on this earth with the two in, in us, and we've got to keep the spirit on top, feeding the spirit so that the flesh doesn't act up. Okay, now we come down to Joseph, Joseph, the character we're going to see starting in chapter 37, and he's a type of or a picture of the air that we become heirs, airship, okay, H-E-I-R, we become heirs, but that's preceded by suffering. We don't get our, an heir comes into what, what's theirs, the joys, the glories, the crowns, the jewels, whatever, but they don't come into that. There's a time first. There's a time of suffering we're going through now. Paul said it best. The temporary light suffering of this world can't be compared to the glories of our future to the crowns of glory and to all that we will have. That's what I'm trying to say. Romans 8, we're at 7. Just flip over to chapter 8. Romans 8, 27. Come on. There we go. Romans 8, 27 says... 8, 17 is what you got here. 8, 17 was probably earlier. I think that's where we're sons of God. Okay, and I forgot to bring it out, but good, good verse. But verse 27 says, He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Maybe I want a, what reference did you say, 817? Uh -huh. Maybe that's the one I did want. I did. Thank you. My notes are incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, folks. Let's go to 817. I'm glad that Loretta's here to keep me on track. I got it correct in one place and not in the other. <clears throat> I probably had fat fingers. You do a marvelous job, bro. By the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit, yes. Get the flesh out of the way or shall let the Spirit shine. <laughs> Verse 17, and if children, heirs also. Heirs of God, fellow heirs with Messiah. Okay, he in, in essence we're called his brethren. We know he's got preeminence, but he, he, in essence we're called his brethren. And it says, if indeed we suffer with Messiah, with Christ, so that we may also be glorified with him. I think you all know there are times of persecution, times of trial and troubles that you suffer for the name of Messiah, for the name of Yeshua Jesus. If you are a witness and a testimony for him like you should be, then I guarantee you, you will experience persecution, you will experience suffering because 
Satan doesn't like that, and when he sees you doing something for the Lord, he wants to take you out. So it just goes with the territory. But notice it doesn't end there. It says that precedes, and then you'll be glorified with him. You'll be in glory. You'll have your, your glorified body, everything. Wow. Hang in there. The best is yet to come. Okay? 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12. Remember, Paul wrote to his beloved son in um, the gospel. That means he wasn't blood son, but he was like a son to him. Um, and I think if you know the story, you know how close these two were. And he was training Timothy even to take over his head position. He told Timothy, if, you, if we endure, we'll also <clears throat> reign with him. If we deny him, he'll also deny us. Let me put in a personal note on that verse. Please never read in to scripture what's not there. Notice the first part. If you endure, you'll reign with him. If you deny him, that means you're not enduring. You're not going through the suffering. You, you wimp out and you turn back from it. What's he going to deny you? Reigning with him. If you want to reign like in the millennial kingdom, you want to be a king, a mayor, or whatever, then you need to endure the suffering now. Show yourself worthy of being put in that head leadership later. It never says here he's going to deny you salvation. God does not give salvation and take it away. And yet those who will teach you that you can lose your salvation will go to this verse and they will, yes, <laughs> whoosh, <laughs> yes. They will tell you, see, you'll lose your salvation. He's not talking about salvation. He's talking about ruling and reigning. If you don't do well here, if, if you can't be trusted to, for yourself, stay strong, why should the Lord put you in a leadership position over others who are going to follow your example? If you're going to wimp out, they'll wimp out. So he's going to put into those responsible positions those who have shown themselves responsible. Those who show that when they get the hot water, they can handle it. Someone once said, Christians are like tea bags. You don't know what flavor they are until they get in hot water. <laughs> well, if you show your flavor to be strong and enduring, you get the reward of reigning. If you don't, you're not going to have the reward of reigning. That doesn't mean that you're kicked out. You just don't have a leadership position because you didn't show yourself worthy of it. That's all it's saying there. So don't let anyone scare you. You didn't earn your salvation. You can't, how do I say it, disearn it. <laughs> you can't do anything to lose it, okay? The Lord God saves you on the basis of the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus, period. Okay, now, when you, uh, you can't lose your salvation, but so many has gotten lukewarm, can you reverse You can that? certainly, yes, you can reverse lukewarm. Lukewarm is, you're hot and you're cold, you're up and you're down, you're yeah. faithful and you're not faithful. Mm -hmm. That's, you're going to lose reward, you're going to lose the joy of the Lord, you're going to lose all kinds of, of blessings and benefits now, and you'll miss out on jewels and things that would have been in your crown in the future. But you're still his kid. God has no grandchildren, and you're still his kid. No matter what you do, you are still your parents' children. You can divorce them in court. You're still their children. You can say, that's not my father, not my mother. Mm -hmm. You're still that child. Same way with salvation. But you don't want to stay in that position. You don't want to stay lukewarm. You don't want to be displeasing to the Lord. You don't want to be needed to take to the woodshed. You want to stay in line. You want to stay strong in the Lord. You want to do for the Lord, and you will receive reward for it. Can you break your fellowship with the Lord? Yes. yes. You're the one who breaks it. You walk away from him. He never walks away from you. And he'll wait right there for you to come back to him. And he's watching, even as the father watched for his prodigal son. He'll bring you back into fellowship. But there are consequences. Look at what happened to that prodigal son. He ends up eating with the, the pigs. He's starving to death. He's miserable. He feels like, you know, he's blown his entire life. It was only the grace of his father that he hadn't blown his entire life. And the grace of your father will bring you back into right fellowship also. But there, there will be consequences that you've already endured and may endure in the future depending on, on what you got involved in. So does it give us the security of our salvation, give us the right to go do whatever we want? 
No, no, you belong to him. You should want to please him. You should want to be obedient. And even if you don't understand, I guarantee you, if you yield to his will, you will see it was the best. It wasn't the oh well or the second choice. It was the best. You can end up with God's second best for you because you don't let him do your best in his best for you in your life. So yes, you absolutely can walk away. You break fellowship and suffer great consequences. Don't go there. Just don't go there. Remember we said you have to feed the spirit. How do you stay from not falling away? Feed the spirit. Be in the word of God. Be in prayer. Be in fellowship with other believers who can be guides and counselors and can see you headed for trouble and warn you and you listen. Encouragers. Absolutely. Absolutely. And for the, because most of my audience is the older, you know, we're not in our 20s anymore. <laughs> Sorry, but we're not. That means there are those younger ones that we should be mentoring. We're a little further down the road. Hey, I've been there. I know what you're going through. This is the scripture that helped me. This is what you need to understand. And point out things lovingly. Nobody wants it slammed in their face. No one wants to be hit with a two by four. But lovingly show them and nurture them. Put an arm around them. Guide them. I can give you story after story. Of, in particular, in mind right now is a young woman who came into a church. And the church is a called out assembly of believers. So came into a fellowship of believers. Her background, 100% unsaved family, no, no, um, no picture for her to follow. What's the word? You know, that she didn't have any example set before her. She's coming to church. She's not dressed appropriately. You know, all kinds of issues because she doesn't know any better. One of the women in the church put her arm around her and became like a mother to her. In fact, she lit up with it felt so loved and said, will you be my spiritual mom? Call me out when I need it. Teach me. She wanted it. How many of those around us, we think that they're out there because, you know, they, they want the world, but they just don't know better. We need to be those examples. We need to be those teachers, and we need to do it in a spirit of love. Again, especially if you think that God's given you the right to correct everybody in this world, Check your attitude with the Lord, <laughs> okay? I'm not saying that, but I am saying, you know, even now, I just closed out my Genesis. How did I do that? And I did. Says, who will not sin, cast the first stone? So you better be careful. Yes, yes, and God will say to you, oh, uh, you're calling them out for that? Hmm, think you need to look at yourself? <laughs> he, the, he you have a prayer when you're done. Um, okay, well, go ahead right now while I call up my Bible. <laughs> Yeah, my, uh, I've been praying for my older son to understand the depth of God's love and his blessing, his prosperity. And God has the new pastor. He, he, he's a Baptist, but he's, he's Holy Ghost. He wants to learn more. And, and he has now, uh, Shepherd Morland, uh, took my son under his wing. And my son now reads this Bible. He's so happy. He grabs my literature of fast and takes pictures or gives to his pastor. So they're like two buddies now, and he's just so excited. That's God great. Just That's great. Closer That's closer. great, yes. And for the men, too, I do encourage you, men, disciple men. They often that. what's said is men sharpen men. You, you men treat each other a little differently than we females. You get your sword out and you do what you need to do. But yes, if you are a father figure, be a, a father to the younger ones also. Same way as I called out the women, absolutely. Um, and that's the best way because men know what men need. Women know what women need. You, you know, I don't care what, how well you think you know the other side. You haven't lived it. <laughs> well, let me just pray for David because his boss called him out. He's one of his top workers. He said, you're too stressed. Calm down. I don't want to lose you. Calm down. Slow down. So he's got a boss on his side 100%. And got a raise. Good. So really pray for the, the other raise that's supposed to be uh, for the, you know, the, how the community gets you know, raised up for the uh, food and all that. He gets okay. another race on top of that. So God is okay. free. And he's paying tithes. Now he really does it. And now his wife, she, uh, her dad taught her, well, tithes is when you go pay to somebody 
No, as your offering. And you're giving it to the Lord, not and to somebody. So my son is doing what he, he said, it's because I'm paying tithes on the Lord. <laughs> and what he means by that, for any you don't understand, he's right with the Lord, he's following what the Lord, the directions of the Lord is given, and, and it does bring blessing. Well, praise the Lord. We're glad to hear for answers to oh, prayer yeah. for you. Yes. And it's the only place in the Bible the Lord says, test me. In your, in, with your finances, yeah. 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 And I guarantee you, you can never outgive the Lord. <laughs> I absolutely guarantee you. <laughs> and I keep, his boss told me, he said, you need to just trust whatever. And I told David, trust the Lord. I know you got a lot on your plate, but give it to God. He knows your heart. He knows how to fix it. Don't you try to carry it. Good, good advice. And let me because also enemy, say, be, try to take him out now. Right, right. But if he's short up in the Word of God, that's where his strength will be. He'll be like Jacob in the Spirit. And let me say, because we've hit on finances and what I just said, if anyone's finding themselves in a position of hardship financially, that does not mean that God's withholding blessing oh, from you. Oh. Paul, a great leader for us said imitate me as I imitate Christ he said I learned to be content whether I'm a base which means in need or whether I'm in riches my set my satisfaction my spiritual my happiness is not dependent on my financial gain or loss so you cannot judge it on that if you know that you're not doing what God's told you to do with your finances, sure, you could see, you know, repercussions in that way. You may or you may not, because I could point you to many people without me being the judge, but just looking at their lives who are running in the money and not doing what they should. So I just want to make sure I'm clear on that. It's not an indicator, because again, there are those who will tell you everybody should be wealthy. I'll just leave it there. He has blessed my son, has blessed me up. Okay. That's great. And was, and eternal wealth is even far I more was important. I'm really praying, Rochelle, that I can give to Israel. Well, now since he pays, my, pays some of my rent, I take that little bit that I, okay, Lord, thank you. I can, pay, I can go get a money order and send him to Israel. <clears throat> That's a blessing, and you'll be blessed again because when you bless Israel, yeah, right. God blesses you. So, so my son is blessed me, so I can give. <clears throat> There you go. Praise the Lord. My daughter don't see that yet. I go, that's all right. I'm going through my son. God is blessing me through him. And just live it and let your daughter see. That's all I'm doing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so verse 1. Yaakov, Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned. By virtue of that being expressed that way, what it's implying is that Yaakov has now entered into his father's inheritance. Remember, he's to have the birthright. It's now his. The land is his, the, the responsibility is his, he's in that position now. It doesn't mean that Yitzhak is dead. It's just like you'd see now, the, the son helping the father and taking over the responsibilities as the father ages. That's what we're seeing. He's in that active role now, taking over, supporting his father, because Isaac is still alive and will be for a number of years. But he's going to carry on that pilgrimage life in Canaan now. We're going to watch and we're going to follow going on down from Yaakov to his sons. And it's going to go on down for there, from there. Sorry. And when it says where his father had sojourned, his father was a foreigner the entire time. His father never put down roots and said, you know, this, this, this is my... Um, what's the word I want? I'm fighting for words, sorry. But Abraham said the same thing. Yeah, this is my home. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is their home, but they lived as, they lived in tents. They didn't put down cement and glass and make a home. It, they would move that tent as God moved them. There's a reason why we're seeing it because of the comparison that God wants to give to us. And let me give it to you from Hebrews, because that will make it very clear. And if some of you are very familiar, if I'm fumbling, you'll say, oh, now I know what she means. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 is our faith chapter, our hall of faith, as we like to call it. All the ones that listed here are great faith. They lived out their faith. Um, verse 8 introduces us to Abraham by faith. Abraham, when he was called, obeyed. Now, look at verse 9. By faith he lived, Abram, as an alien, as a foreigner, as a sojourner, in the land of promise. Okay, he lived as one who's temporary moving around in the land of promise. 
as if in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with his son Yitzhak and his grandson Yaakov. They were doing it also. They too were fellow heirs of the same promise. That land is theirs, but they're living as tent dwellers. They're living as sojourners, as foreigners. Why? Verse 10. For he, Abraham, because it's talking about him, for he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. That's what they were looking to. Their permanent home, where they're going to settle down, put down roots forever, that's their heavenly home. Verse 13, I think it is. Um, yeah. Verse 13. Yeah, all these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, that's what becomes theirs, is that heavenly home as it goes on. They weren't seeking the country on earth. They were seeking the heavenly country. We say the same thing. We say that this is not our home. We're just a passing through. We say that our citizenship is in heaven. That's what the scriptures tell us. Once you become a, a son of Yeshua, then your citizenship is in heaven. That's your permanent forever. The promises that they'd have this land and their family would is still good, it's still valid, but they lived with their eyes on the heavenly. We have a place to call home temporarily right now, but this is not our permanent home. We've got our eyes on the same. The heavenly wasn't made with human hands, isn't going to change, isn't going to morph, isn't going to be a, well, it was a nice place and now it's a pretty nasty neighborhood. No, it's going to be glorious forever and ever and that's where we get to stay forever and ever and ever and ever doesn't mean we don't leave heaven i'm going to go explore all over i want to see everything god made and i think he's gonna fly. Gonna... we're going to fly we're going to think and be there we're not yeah, going to need to get on a plane and fly we're going to just fly <laughs> and, and we're going to have a blast but they had their eyes on what they should have i had so many thoughts run through my mind just now and all gone but i think i've said enough if it comes back, I'll, I'll come back to it. But um, I think you all can relate. I think you know what I'm saying. Um, I can't wait to see the permanent tabernacle. You know, what, what we had on earth that became the temple also was something. But it was patterned after the heavenly. I can't wait to see that. Mind blower. Okay. You want a sneak peek, not of what heaven looks like because it's, it's man-made. <clears throat> But call up the Messianic song, I Enter the Holy of Holies. Uh, very beautifully done. And just mm. watch it. It gets me all excited when I think, <laughs> wow, one day I'll enter the Holy of Holies. <laughs> that Holy I'll be Holy. today. <laughs> we'll have a great Bible study. Come there. Not only will I not mispronounce names, but I can tell you all about what it mattered and how it fit, and I have all the answers to all the other questions we've had all along. Yeah, it's coming. <laughs> so you're welcome to come to my place that the Lord's making for me right now. You're more than welcome. The door will always be open. <laughs> I'll be there. We're going to rejoice together. Exactly. We'll jump up and down for a few thousand years before we settle down and, and, and talk about, about other feet things. Or pain or nothing. Nothing. Can't even imagine, can we? I mean, wow. But while we're here, we'll go on and study back in Genesis 37 so we can learn from it and live it better down here for our Lord. As I mentioned in verse 1, we're being told that uh, Jacob has taken over for his father. He's living in the land of Canaan, but Yitzhak is still alive. Okay, He's going to die at the age of 180. Yaakov, um, okay, <laughs> I don't want to confuse you. Isaac was 60 when he gave birth to Jacob. He was 100 when Jacob went to Padan Aram, and he had Joseph when he was in Padan Aram. He's there for 20 years. He had Joseph very close to the end. That means that Jacob was about 95 when Joseph was born, and that makes Isaac about 155, okay? So if Isaac's around, and, and we're, we're close, I'm not saying exactly, but if he was around 155 when Joseph, Joseph was born, and Joseph is now 17, 
then 55, 65, 72. He's around 172. He's not going to die till he's 180. So we know he's, he's got mm. 8 to 10 more years. I'll just put it in round figures like that. The promise that, of the land that God had given them, they never saw it entirely. They never owned it entirely. That fulfillment is yet future. It is theirs, but they've never taken full possession of all that's theirs. Go back to chapter 15 for the parameters. It goes, it's, it's more than what's called Israel today. I've talked about this before. Part of Egypt, it's part of it's Jordan, it's Syria, it's Lebanon. Syria goes toward Iraq and Iran. I need to reverse those, Iran and then Iraq. I mean, it's huge, the area that is meant to be Israel. God will keep his promise, but they're living in that land of promise, but they're living as, as temporary dwellers. Okay, now, our next verse, these are the records of the generations of Yaakov. We've had this before, not by of Yaakov, but by Avraham, by Yitzhak. We saw that that's their signature, that what's been written to this point, in, since the last time we saw that phrase, is the records that they've been keeping. Remember, we even said that Jacob probably got Esau's records when they were together at times, when they buried their father at different times to keep the records because he was the record keeper. Very often you see that in the family today. There'll be one in the family who likes to keep the records, who keeps that, that family tree, who draws it all out and tells everybody else or goes and researches today. Yeah, we did. Very often. There you go. Yeah. There you go. And sometimes it's very interesting and sometimes you don't get much information. Well, it's great but. with ours. We go way back to the uh, pilgrims. And it goes way back, and we are all from the uh, Sim of God uh, church, preachers, leaders, whatever, all on my mother's side. Okay, so you found gold in your... Yeah, I'm so excited about that. <laughs> That's great, that's great. Well, this is where Yaakov's records are going to end. He's given what he considered important, and this is where it ends. It started, if you want to see where he started, it started in chapter 25 and verse 19. That's where his father finished and where he picked up. And remember, generations means from the Hebrew historical records. Here are our historical records. So these are the records that that Jacob made that would have helped Moshe, Moses, when he's compiling the book of Bereshit, Genesis, okay? Um, Jacob included Esau's line. He, I already said that he probably got it from Esau when, you know, when he was um, with him. But notice how we've already seen how Moshe put in his, his comments when he knew. It would be like me, what could I say um, that you can relate to? I don't know. I'm not coming up with an example here, but we know the changes that are taking place in Israel. Bethlehem used to be six miles out from Israel now because, I mean from Jerusalem, now because of the way both have grown, they're on top of each other. Things like that. I would add in that editorial note. I wouldn't say Bethlehem six miles south of, of Jerusalem. I would say on the outskirts of Jerusalem because I know the difference now, just making it accurate for the time I'm writing it, but it doesn't mean it wasn't true what was written before. Before, they were six miles apart, okay? That's all I'm trying to say. And we know that by Moshe's time, Moshe's time, we know that Esau's descendants were the Edomites. They were a whole nation to be considered concerning to the Israelites. But it's also now very interesting. We're going to have more chapters devoted to Yosef than to the whole first period of Bereshit, of Genesis. We have all, all this genealogy and all that we were given in chapters 1 through 11. We have more that we're going to be told about Joseph, more chapters dedicated to Joseph. He's going to have more than even was given to Avraham and even given to Yitzhak. He's got... Um, well, Abraham had eight chapters. Yitzhak had 11 chapters. No, 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 no. Let me take that back. i got to read my notes right. Abraham got 13 chapters. Isaac got eight chapters. 
Jacob got 11 chapters. Joseph's going to get 14 chapters. <laughs> okay? Wow. 14 chapters. There's a reason for this and why I'm so excited to bring us into Yosef. I love my patriarchs. Do not get me wrong. I love studying them. Each one, as we let go of their hand, I feel like I'm letting go of a, a personal family member and, and, and a friend, and it's, it's hard for me to let go. But Yosef, he, he is amazing. Um, it doesn't mention it in Scripture this way. You'll not find a verse that says it, but Yosef is a beautiful type of Messiah, a type of Christ in his life. We're going to see at least 87 times in Yosef's life that he's a picture of Christ. 36 times we're going to see in this chapter alone. And I'm going to take you through. I will number them with you so that you can follow it and see it. You don't have to write them all down. You don't have to hold on to them all. But I think there's a lot of richness when we see such a parallel. We're given such a picture. Why does this excite me? Because so many people want to separate the Jews from the Christians. They want to separate the Old Testament, as they call it, from the New Testament. And when I can show you, here's one in the quote old, I like to call it the original covenant because it was originally what God first gave to and he gave it to um, the line that becomes known as the Jews. And, and Paul says, what advantage did the Jews have? They had the oracles of God. They had the words of God. Yes, they were blessed above the others because God entered into special relationship with them. But as I can see in Yosef, such a picture of Yeshua Jesus in the new, I can take this to my Jewish people and say, look, it's here in Bereshit. This one called Yeshua later, look, here we see the, the type in Yosef and show that this is one long story. This is continuous. This is telling the same story. It's not two different stories. It's not the Christian side of the Bible and the Jewish side of the Bible. I hate hearing that. I cringe every time I do. There's nothing more wrong than that sentence because the whole thing was even written by Jewish people. How could you say that part of it's not Jewish? It's all. And how could you say that it's only the new that's important for the, quote, Christians today? How can you understand high school if you've never gone to kindergarten through your, your junior high years? You need all of that to fully understand your high school education. I talked to one just the other day that was so sick in first grade, he missed the majority of first grade. He said he paid for it. All the rest, they didn't, this was years and years ago, he's, he's older now, they didn't catch him up and teach him everything he should have in first grade, and they threw him into <clears> second, <throat> into third, into fourth. He was always struggling because he didn't have that foundation. If you want to fully understand the new, the Brit Hadasha, you've got to study the original. You've got to get your foundation, and you've got to see it's one complete picture. And I love it. My little love son, it. Uh, when you went into kindergarten, she was an old, strict, and he said, your child will read. And a lot of the parents said, they're too young. No. And they had the homework. But the next year, we had a teacher who was the opposite. And it just left a big, you know, they're used to studying. All of a sudden, you go <coughs> do homework. You know, it just laughing, but you know what? It really paid off in school. It does. It does. You need a solid foundation. You need to start with the beginning, and you need to complete it. You need she to go through it all. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. Really, they did. We had the same example with a very strict typing teacher who wouldn't let you look at your keys, and you had to memorize, and you had to learn, and you had to practice. And the next teacher came in very lax and let them look at their keys and never made them really memorize. And out of those two classes, the ones who became skilled in typing was day and night. First year got it, second year didn't. There's a reason. There's a reason. So we've got Joseph with all of these um, examples given to him. There's one that I've forgotten, but I'll, I'll pull it back up when I get there. Let me also point out who he is. He's the last of seven in Genesis that we're, we, we've highlighted. Okay, we had Aval, Abel, and we had Enoch, and Noah, Avraham, Yitzhak, Jacob, Yaakov, and Yosef. Okay, these are seven 
um, that were highlighted because they're all mentioned in the Hall of Faith. They're all mentioned in Hebrews 11. Enoch showed us the walk of faith. Noah showed us the preser sorry, perseverance of faith. 120 years building that ark. Okay, he persevered. Abraham showed us obedience. You know how obedient he was that he was willing to even give up Yitzhak. Isaac showed the power of faith, the strength, the power in it, where Yaakov shows us that discipline that we talked about, walking in the, in the spirit, not in the flesh. And Yosef is going to show us the triumph of faith, that that faith triumphs. He never complains. He never compromises. He was loved and he was hated. He was favored and he was abused. He was tempted and he was trusted. He was exalted and he was abased. Yet in no point in 110 years of life that Yosef lives on this earth did he ever seem to get his eyes off of God or did he ever seem to not trust him. What an example. And a, a, a good picture of who our Messiah is. Adversity didn't harden his character. Prosperity didn't ruin him. That's a big one because often prosperity will ruin good people. He was the same in his private life as he was in his public life. He is a truly great example and a beautiful example of our Messiah, of our of the one in our Brit Hadashah, that the original is all about him. It's all looking toward him, then we have him, and then it's looking back at him. It's what it's all about. So, with this in mind, let's spend some time with Yosef, and let's enjoy getting to know him better. Um, he is the one, by the way, he's going to be one of 12 sons, but he's the one who's going to be given the birthright. He's not the firstborn, he's not the secondborn, he's not the thirdborn, he's, he comes down in the list, but he is the one that is going to be given the birthright. His name means adding, you know, like a plus sign, adding. They don't make sense. They've always given to the first, and then we'll see why. Yeah. We'll see why. If you don't know why, I can give you scriptures later, and you can need, yeah. you can go read the story on your own. But we'll see why. The same way though that we saw Jacob got the birthright when Esau was first born, we saw that Isaac was the son of promise, not Ishmael who was born 13 years earlier. But we'll see. This one was God's choice, and we'll see why. We'll see what knocked out the others and what why he's brought in. Okay? And with his name meaning adding, and that's what, if you go back to his birth in chapter 30 and verse 24, where his mother, Rachel, Rachel, named him, God, she, she said, I've got a son, and she was asking God, add to him, give me another son, which she does get in Benjamin, even though she loses her life in his birth. But Yeshua, Jesus, is the one who adds to, the, to heaven's population. He, you come into faith in him and you, you, you have your citizenship in heaven. So he's the one adding because he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. So he's the one that adds to it. And also look at Yochanan, John 12 and 24. Uh, let me get that real quick. John 12 and 24 where we read, it's almost there, chapter, and it's Yochanan in Hebrew, John 12, 24, we read, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. Yeah. That's the adding. Out of death comes life, and it comes abundant life, and greater life, and wow. So this, he had a great name. I know that God saw to it that he was named, a name that means adding, even because right there we begin to see our picture of how Yosef is a picture of our Savior, who is adding to his family each as they come to him. Hallelujah. Okay, so we're told that he was 17 years of age. We don't get his history, what happened for his first 16 years. He probably was six when he left Padam Aram. Because we know that that um, Yosef, Yosef, sorry, Yaakov, his father, had worked the 14 years for Rachel and for Leah, 
remember it was supposed to be seven and then seven were added and then Lavon Laban got six more years out of him so uh, in that last period of time where we have the birth of Yosef it, it seems very close to that right after the 14th years when it's named that he was born so he probably was about six now if they've been in the land for 11 years we've got him at 17 years of age so that all makes it right they've probably been dwelling in Hebron a year maybe two years by now and again Yitzhak is still alive so Yitzhak grandfather of Yosef has met his grandson his grandson knows his grandfather we often separate these Bible characters because we study their lives separate I want you to see there was interrelation Yaakov was about 108 that makes Yitzhak 168 he doesn't die to 180 so for the first 12 13 years of uh, um, Joseph's life he is alive okay with that background and suddenly looking at the clock <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to stop right there. We're going to find out what he's doing at 17 years of age and why that is significant because that's going to lead right into our second point of how he is a picture of Yeshua. So first point, he, his name means adding and it's Yeshua who adds, adds into the family of God. And we're going to see in the second point what he's doing at 17 years of age that's a picture of Yeshua. And if you don't know, just for you a little bit, you'll get it. You'll get it, but I'll help you too. And we, like I say, we're going to have, um, what did I tell you, 36? Yeah, 36 times in this chapter. i just give you the first. We've got 35 more comparisons where he's like Messiah, like Yeshua Jesus. So come back next week. We'll probably go through. We might get through all of them. Who knows? I'm not going to promise <laughs> uh, because we're going to look at the scriptures. We're going to see it. Uh, we're going to be going back and forth between our original and our British are new so that you can see that how the two relate how they are at one story how when prophesies and looks forward and how one fulfills very very important for us to know and understand so I hope that'll be a blessing to you I love it to me it's very very rich I love studying Yosef and I love seeing the picture he is of my Savior so on that note, let's close in prayer, and then we'll open up the mics and uh, go from there. Lord God, we thank you that you are the orchestrator, that even before the foundations of this world, even before you created Adam, you saw us. You saw the hearts that would turn to you, and you have allowed us to come into that privileged position of being an heir with Messiah Yeshua, having citizenship in heaven, and knowing that one day we will live in your very presence forever and ever. Hallelujah. Praise you and thank you as we remain here, Lord, though. Let us study, and as we study Joseph and his character, a godly character, a character worthy of showing the comparison of our Messiah and Savior, Lord, let us have that kind of character too. Perfect in us, Lord. It changes where we need it. Let us yield to your direction that we might be conformed to your image that as you say from glory to glory let us shine more with the Shekhinah glory of our God as we too can be a, a, an example and a picture of you so we thank you that you work with mere flesh that you remember the frailty of us in our humanness and that it is you in us who does it it is by your spirit by your Ruch HaKodesh that it is accomplished and we praise you and we thank you we are privileged so privileged to call you Abba, our Father, our Daddy, and to know that we have an eternal home with you forever. Hallelujah. To you we give all glory, praise, and honor forever and ever and ever. And everyone says, Amen and Amen. So be it. So be it. Great note to end on. Come back and, and uh, study Yosef with me. I love his character.